I'm George Snyder, a veteran of uh, World War II in the European theater. And uh, welcome to our program, Shooting from the Hip, an unrehearsed impromptu program during which I interview World War II veterans and we hear first-hand accounts of their experiences in the war. Now, in this series, we hope to have uh, all the different branches represented, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, and the Marines, and from all theaters throughout the world where the Americans <coughs> fought. Today's guest is Hewitt Gomez. Hewitt was in the 8th, Army Air Force, or the Army Air Corps at that time, stationed in England. Since then, the Air Corps has been changed to Air Force. And then in uh, 1946, they got their own nomenclature, and it's now called the U.S. Air Force. Now, Hewitt had a unique assignment in the 8th Air Force. He was a carpetbagger. And no, he didn't come down from the north and exploit the south. <laughs> so uh, Hewitt, tell us, who were the carpetbaggers? We were a secret uh, group that flew at night, low altitude, dropping packages to the underground, packages which contained mines and ammunition. We also dropped uh, guns, rifles, and uh, because of the, the fact that we were dropping packages, uh, we were codenamed carpetbaggers. Now, likewise, UPS tells us that they got their idea from the carpetbaggers, us, dropping packages all over the world. Incidentally, the UPS is a th has the third largest air force with all the business. So that's where we got our name. Uh, so uh, what was your group? Was it a squadron or was it a group or what was it called? It was a group and there were three squadrons in the group. The gr group name was 492nd Bomb Group. Uh, one of our squadrons dropped leaflets to the uh, people down below saying that the Germans are about to give up. It was propagandist type yeah. of stuff. and. Uh, and our squadron flew these uh, missions at night, as I mentioned before. Well, how many planes were in your squadron? There were 42 planes. 42. Uh, at the end of this, our time of service, we lost 28 of those. We had 197 casualties, men who didn't return from the missions. And uh, what kind of planes did you have? There was a Ford. Uh, a B-24, I brought a model here in case anyone would like to see it. This is a four-engine bomber. Our planes were modified, mainly painted black since we flew at night. The nose gun was taken out from our airplane to put a bench in where the bombardier could sit and assist me in navigating, finding the, the target. The target area was somewhere in a pasture, two or three men waiting for the drop that we would make. And uh, he had to be there to help find this. It wasn't like flying at high altitude where you could see a refinery 30 miles off and, and direct your pilot to it. This being at low level, you could only see two or three miles ahead and uh, looking for two people instead of a refinery. So the navigation had to be sharp, and to be sharp, we needed help from the bombardier. Mm. He was the eyes. I was curtained in, because we didn't want any lights on in the airplane flying at night. What was the uh, rest of the crew besides the bombardier and the navigator? Pilot, co-pilot, uh, waist gunner, tail gunner, and a dispatcher. The dispatcher had a, uh, a, a hole where, where the airplane used to have a, a belly turret gun. That was taken out, leaving a large hole, which was covered with wood. And from that hole, packages, 
and spies or agents were dropped. The agents were called Joe and Josephine, if it's a lady, and the, that hole was called the Joe hole. <laughs> so I never saw any of these agents because we would get to the takeoff point on the runway and an automobile would bring them out at the last minute and they would come up from the Joe hole into the back of the airplane. Therefore, I never saw one. So uh, you, you had some armament, you had some gunners on there? You had some? Uh, we had a tail gunner and a waist gunner. With? And, and a top turret gunner. With 50 caliber? 50 caliber machine oh. guns, yes. And that's all you had, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, and all your missions were at night? Everyone, yes. Everyone was at night, huh? Hmm. So what were most of your drops? Were this uh, supplies or personnel? Most of it was, we had cylinders, uh, 12 cylinders that fit into the bomb bay, and those cylinders were filled with guns, radio equipment, dynamite, mines, uh, to go to the underground. Yeah. Now, when I mention the underground, think about D-Day, when that happened, these people that we supplied were attacking the Germans from the rear. And one general said that it ended the war six months in advance because of the supplies that they had to attack the Germans from the rear while the fo our forces were attacking from the front. Also, they were destroying railroads and bridges with the dynamite to prevent uh, reinforcement of German troops. Hmm. So uh, these, you talk about these bundles, were they dropped by parachute? Yes, by parachute. And they were? At a low level, 500 feet off the ground. And they were dropped, what, through the Bombay doors? Bombay doors and as well as that Joho. Oh, the Joho. Some well, packages that was a little were small, there. though, wasn't it? For well, it was about uh, 15, 18 inches in diameter. Hmm. Uh, for some of our viewing audience, they might not be too familiar with the operations of the uh, resistance forces and the OSS. Now, the uh, the Americans supplied agents into Europe in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. This was created by President Roosevelt in 1941 for the purpose of spying and committing uh, acts uh, against the enemy, um, like uh, Hewitt says, blowing up railroads, uh, ammunition dumps, and so forth. And they would coordinate this with the resistance forces. So uh, when, you, uh, you, when you dropped personnel out of the Joe hole, uh, these were sometimes radio operators and uh, other clandestine operators of different kinds, right? That's some correct. were women. Some were women. Yeah. And, you know, some of them were fluent with uh, French language and German language, so they were helpful to the underground in communicating with those people. Yeah, when you, you dropped in a particular country, I think one of the requirements was that you had to speak the language. Yes. Because I was approached to uh, be in the OSS because I speak French, so I would have been dropped in France in my mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we d decided that most of your supplies were, uh, drops were supplies, and uh, you had some personnel dropped. Uh, some, of the, some of the women would operate as uh, radio operators and, uh, and couriers. One of the most famous ones was Julia Childs, the uh, cooking expert. She was in the OSS. So uh, let's talk about a typical flight to drop some packages. You get a request. Where does a request originate? Is it from the OSS and the uh, resistance themselves? They want certain supplies? Yes. they. Those people on the ground in France, also Denmark and Norway later on, would radio and 
the Air Force had a British plane, the uh, lightweight plane, I'm trying to think of the name right now, but it would fly at 40,000 feet and the radio would uh, call them and give them coordinates of where it would be safe to drop that next morning. And that message would go to headquarters in England and then the headquarters would contact the different bases that we operated from and given us the coordinates. Hmm. As the navigator, I was the commander of the airplane rather than the pilot. And uh, I would be called in like 3.30 in the afternoon to be given the coordinates where we were to drop that night. And then I would plan my course of entry and return and I'd make a copy for the bombardier so that, as I said, he would aid me in finding that small area. Uh, and it was successful because we, we made our drop every time. We never were not able to find the location, whereas some crews had to turn around and they failed to, to know where they were, where the, where the drop was to be made. Okay, so you're, you're in England and you get your you get your shopping list. You want uh, they want some explosives and some mines. rifles, some mines, some medical supplies, mm -hmm. and and uh, radio parts. Mm -hmm. So you take off in the middle of the night, and you're heading 450 miles from England into your target in France, and your target might be a 40 or 50 acre plot of ground. And uh, how in the world did you find that as a navigator? You had to be the most important man on the plane. Well, they told us we were selected. I guess uh, the performance that I made in training uh, helped me be selected. I'm not trying to say I was the smartest navigator, but <laughs> I think, you see, in navigation, you could be a lead navigator or you could be a follower navigator like most of the navigators that flew on missions where, where bombs were dropped, they flew in formation, so he didn't have to be that sharp. Whereas flying solo and lead navigator, you had to be a little bit better prepared to find locations like I mentioned, out in the pastures uh, from low levels, whereas from high altitude you could spot the refinery targets that you were to bomb from 30 miles away. So you, your navigation didn't have to be as sharp yeah. as did it the, was with the carpetbaggers. Uh, did all the planes, when they had a, a bombing formation, say a couple hundred planes, did each plane have a navigator? Yes. Every one? Yes. But there was a lead navigator? Yes. Okay. All right, now, the other thing that I can't fathom is... You're doing this at night. What's your altitude when you fly over the target? 500 feet. Okay. You're flying at 500 feet at what speed? Uh, about 265 miles an okay. hour. Okay. 265 miles an hour at 500 feet over a 40-acre plot. That means you're over the target about one second. <laughs> so how in the world can you drop your supplies on the bullseye? Well, that's why we had three weeks of special training before <laughs> we started. But uh, the uh, the, t the target was harder to find than the drop was. The uh, biggest worry we had was, will the underground get these supplies or will the Germans, who are all around, yeah. capture and kill the uh, Frenchmen or Danish people that we dropped to and take the supplies, which did happen, we knew. Yeah. Well, did the uh, resistance forces signal you in any way? Did they have flares out or flashlights, I think? That's a good question. Uh, when they would hear our airplane, they would light three fires which were prepared for immediate burning. So immediately we would see those three uh, in a row fires and we knew we were at the right target. Plus they would give us a code signal by flashlight and we would return it and uh, 
we knew we were at the right place. Okay, so you have, if you're using B-24s, you must have been carrying a pretty big load all the time. Yes. Could you drop all of them at one time, or do you have to make subsequent passes? No, one pass. One pass, drop them all. But huh? I might mention uh, that our biggest hazard was, because of the low flying, a lot of our airplanes ran into trees or small hills, because at 500 feet, uh, your map may show a uh, elevation of 100 feet, but uh, there might be a hill that's <laughs> 500 feet and you're at 500 feet. So like I mentioned earlier, we lost 28 of our airplanes flying into trees or mountains or what have you. Did you uh, lose any planes from any enemy fighters or any aircraft fire? No. Uh, Fortunately for us, we didn't get there until early February of 1945. We learned after the war that the Luftwaffe, which were very dangerous with their fighter planes, were running low on fuel thanks to the bombing that was done by the high altitude flights. Uh, they were, we learned later that on takeoff, the airplane, the pilot would be towed to the takeoff point by oxen to save fuel. And to uh, answer your question, coming out of Norway one morning at 2.30, we had a JU-88, which was a <laughs> medium uh, fighter bomber, yeah. was heading right towards us. And naturally, we all held our breath, and he just kept going right below us. And uh, undoubtedly, we didn't know it at the time, but undoubtedly, he was running low on fuel, and he didn't want to waste any time shooting at us. <laughs> he was heading for the base. <laughs> so, so most of your uh, fatalities and your casualties were from crashes? Crashes, yeah. correct. I understand that at times the resistance received some operatives in a small plane that could actually land in these little plots. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, pick up some and, and return them to England, but you guys used your big plane for that. Okay. Yeah, the little plane that I mentioned earlier was the Mosquito. Yeah. Oh, that, that's it's made a of plywood. Plywood plane, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was fast and could fly as high as 40,000 feet, so the radio messages were safe up there at 40,000 feet. Were uh, most of your drops in France? Not mine, but uh, the ones who preceded me, as I mentioned, we didn't arrive until early February mm. of 45, and my first drops were made in April. Uh, we made seven in my career. We made seven missions, and the war ended May the 8th, so April comes May. So I wasn't there but six weeks before the war ended. Yeah. Uh, of the missions, which ones were the most dangerous to uh, Denmark or? Denmark. Denmark probably. And yes, we, uh, the navigator would pick the course as I said earlier and I decided to enter into Denmark where there was a, a river outlet into the uh, uh, cha English Channel. Figuring well the flak stations would be further apart so I aimed my airplane right into that river opening, and all hell broke loose. A big light hit our airplane, <laughs> and ground, ground fire from 50 caliber guns were shooting at us. We received a couple of them in our airplane, uh, two or three, and uh, we learned after everything was over that two British planes doing the same type of missions were shot down hmm. right behind me. Uh, we woke them up and they did their job and eliminated two planes. Yeah, well, I, w I would assume that uh, flying to France, you had a pretty, pretty easy flight pattern, didn't you? You didn't have to fly over too much of occupied uh, France, whereas in uh, Denmark and Norway, you were flying over some pretty hostile country there. Yes, yes. So, 
That was the uh, that was worse flying than in France. Well, George, I, uh, I mention this because I, there are very few people who know about the troops in Norway. Uh, Hitler had 175,000 troops in Norway, protecting what was called light water, which was used yeah, in making the atomic was. bomb. So when uh, the Allied forces entered into Germany, it was crucial and necessary for Hitler to want those troops back in Germany to defend his country. Hmm. Well, William Colby, who was part of our group and a major at the time, he assembled 32 skiers that were dropped over Norway in, in the middle of the night, and they skied 70 miles across the country of Norway, blowing up ports, railroads, bridges, to prevent those uh, German troops from leaving Norway, mm -hmm. and it worked. Incidentally, William Colby was uh, later the CIA director in the United States, a, a great man. He was found drowned uh, opposite his uh, fishing camp, yeah. but some of us don't believe that he committed suicide as was reported, because our records were sealed for 50 years to prevent collaborators from getting to us for what we accomplished. And he accomplished so much, he would be the one that they'd want to eliminate. Hmm. So we think that he was killed. Hmm. So we, we didn't mention it earlier, but the, uh, the OSS was later renamed the, what we have today, the CIA. Now, he also mentioned that it's been reported that the efforts of the resistance forces shortened the war as much as six months. So I, I think that's exaggerated a little bit, but there's no question about it. They did uh, shorten it quite a bit. And like you say, even on, on D-Day, they kept German forces from getting to the beaches by blowing up railroads and uh, bridges. And, and the, the stories of the resistance forces is very fascinating. And these patriots, they took a chance because if they got caught, they, they were shot. And in <coughs> fact, I witnessed uh, one who got shot one time because he, he had uh, given information to the Americans. Now, uh, well, it, well, as you're mentioning, and you may recall that from D-Day, it was only about six weeks before Paris was uh, captured, yeah. and less than a, uh, another two weeks before France was liberated. Yeah, uh, and that was because of the uh, uh, underground being armed and pre yeah, preventing they, they, uh, the Germans from reinforcing themselves. Yeah, they finally finally revolted after after uh, the uh, Allies were advancing toward toward Paris. Uh, some of you viewers might not know it, but uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, Hewitt was invited to Washington, D.C., where he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. This is the highest civilian award in the United States. And uh, this was a special ceremony that was held for surviving members of the OSS. And uh, since Hewitt participated in, in activities with the OSS, he was invited to this. Apparently there were about, what, 60 people there uh, still uh, surviving? I, I think 40. I think 40, 40 would be a closer number. And uh, actually, the OSS at its peak had as many as 13,000 agents working all over the world. And uh, Hewitt also has another distinction, and uh, I share this with him too, because I have it, and that's that he is, he was knighted by the French government and uh, he is now a chevalier in the Légion d'Honneur, the Legion of Honor, and that's a great honor to have. That is France's highest military award, and uh, they have been giving this to uh, Americans who participated in any activity that resulted in the liberation of France. So congratulations, Hewitt. <laughs> And you too. Two great wards to have. 
So uh, if you have anything else to add, uh, if not, I thank you for coming and ask our viewers to watch for our next program when we'll be having another guest and we'll be shooting from the hip. So until then, adios. <laughs>